This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for October 9th through the 15th. On this week's show, someone takes exception to someone winning an award, and no, it's not Kanye this time. We look back on the date of October 15th, and we celebrate the birthday of a Beatle. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. You know, awards time is supposed to be a happy time for most artists. It's a time to reflect on the past year and to celebrate your fellow artists' accomplishments. Yeah, who am I kidding? It's a time for artists to get jealous of each other and sometimes to even act out about it. Most people lately will pull a Kanye or a 50 Cent and walk on stage to interrupt someone's acceptance speech. In Kanye's case, he actually did that twice. Apparently, Country music artists are more gangsta, and they take it to a whole other level. Or at least one of them did. Back in the early 1970s, country music purists had a problem. Pop music acts were beginning to cross over into country music and dominating the country music charts. Not only were they top in the country charts, they were actually winning awards for doing it. On October 14, 1974, Olivia Newton-John won Female Vocalist of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, and that made the purists furious. That same year, though, country music singer Charlie Rich won the top award, Entertainer of the Year. That win would come back to haunt the Country Music Association in both an insulting and funny way the next year. On October 13, 1975, that year's Country Music Association Awards were handed out, and much like the Oscars, the winner of the previous year handed out that award the next year. The night originally went very smoothly. Then, the final award was presented, Entertainer of the Year. Charlie Rich, since he won the award the year before, came out to present the award this year. Charlie read off the names, and then he took the envelope with the winner's name on it and opened it. And what he did next shocked the audience and made them laugh at the same time. First, Charlie took out his cigarette lighter, lit it, and started burning the card with the winner's name, while on stage, mind you. Then, Charlie read, John Denver's name on the card, and made a noise of disgust. The winner, pop superstar John Denver, was not there but was on the satellite feed accepting the award. He was completely oblivious to the fact that Rich burned the card with his name on it. Rich, for his part, was banned from future award shows. Still, my thought is that the Kanye's and the 50 Cent's of the world need to do something more dramatic now. Maybe, I don't know, tackle the winner, or burn their hair, or something. Or maybe slap a presenter. Oh wait, that's already been done. Not even Kanye and 50 Cent have actually managed to top Charlie Rich burning the winner's card with John Denver's name on it, at the Country Music Association Awards on October 13th, 1975. Next, what if I told you that a now-famous Broadway show got popular because of an album? You would say, sure, that happens all the time. Green Day and American Idiot, for instance. True, but shows like that were adapted only after the album, American Idiot, or movie, insert virtually any Disney movie, or songbook, Billy Joel, Motown, Carole King, whichever, became popular. This next story is about how a Broadway show became popular because it was purposely marketed as an album first. Back in the late 1960s, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice had a show called Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It wasn't too popular at the time, playing mainly in churches over in England. 
Undeterred, they decided to work on what would be their third musical with an uncontroversial subject matter that people would flock to like crazy, Jesus Christ. Yep, no controversy there. Just to kick it up a notch, they concentrated the story on Judas. Then, to take it even further, they decided not to portray him as a villainous backstabber that he was, but as someone who was bothered with the fact that Jesus had a massive following and was becoming a celebrity. Still, that shouldn't stop anyone from backing this new venture, should it? After all, it's the 1960s, free love, hippies, and all that sort of stuff. Surely people would fork over money for this, at least rich ones would. Yeah, no. Financial backers were shockingly not ready to fork over millions for this kind of thing. Andrew and Tim were stuck. How could they get people to back this? Then they got an idea. How about they put out the cast concept album first to whet everybody's appetite? They gathered up a cast that included some people who would later become famous. Singer Helen Reddy, who would have a huge hit with the song I Am Woman. Murray Head, who had the hit One Night in Bangkok from the musical Chess. And Yvonne Elliman, who sang If I Can't Have You from the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack. They recorded this album on October 10th, 1969. Then, on October 16, 1970 in England, and October 27, 1970 in America, they released their album. The reaction, as you would expect from virtually anything that Weber and Rice has ever done, was not met kindly by the critics. They trashed it. The BBC, for its part, banned the album, calling it sacrilegious. Didn't matter, though. The album did its job. It became a huge smash with the public, and it got the public excited for the Broadway show, which by then had found financial backing. In July of 1971, after finally getting the financial backing that it needed, the musical production of Jesus Christ Superstar had its first official run, not on Broadway, but at the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where they staged it as a concert. By the end of 1971, the production had become so popular that unauthorized productions started popping up all over America, from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles, California. The original Broadway production opened on October 12, 1971 at the Mark Hellinger Theater at 237 West 51st Street. The theater was named after journalist Mark Hellinger and at one time had been a movie theater. Jeff Fenholt played Jesus, Ben Vereen and Carl Anderson both played Judas, switching off when one needed a break or became ill, Paul Ainsley played Herod, Barry Denon played Pontius Pilate, and Yvonne Elliman, the aforementioned, played Mary Magdalene. The critics were split on the production. Some Christians found it blasphemous, while Jewish leaders weren't thrilled with it either. For others, it was the fact that two African Americans played Judas. No matter. The production went on to be nominated for five Tony Awards, including one for Best Score, but it didn't win any. It did, however, win a Drama Desk Award and a Theatre World Award. It then went to London, England, at the Palace Theatre in 1972, and other places from there. It was also adapted into a film in 1973 that was nominated for numerous Golden Globe Awards. Just goes to show you that sometimes you have to bet on yourself and your dreams and come up with a different way of doing things in order to get your dreams accomplished. The recording of the Jesus Christ Superstar musical album, October 10th, 1969. The opening of the musical on Broadway, October 12th, 1970. Next, if there was ever anyone who was the poster boy for punk rock, it was Sid Vicious. The man had anti-establishment written all over him with swagger to match. He became the bassist of the Sex Pistols because the group had just fired their original bassist, and Vicious happened to be at every one of the Sex Pistols shows, so he was familiar to the guys. Sid, however, had a couple of problems. The first was that in the beginning, he couldn't play bass. In fact, for some gigs, the band 
unplugged his bass from the sound system. The second and more important problem was that he was a serious drug addict. By the time he joined the group, he was already using multiple drugs. And it didn't help that his mother, Ann Beverly, was also an addict and even gave him some drugs. Because of his use, he was hospitalized for a time for treatment of hepatitis. And this meant that he missed a lot of time during the recording of the only Sex Pistols album, Never Mind the Bullocks, Here's the Sex Pistols. So Steve Jones had to play both bass and electric guitar on the majority of the album itself. The drug use also got in the way of the group. Sid went after audience members routinely, and the band broke up two weeks into their U.S. tour in 1978. It was around this time that Sid met and started a very volatile relationship with a party girl and heroin user, Nancy Spungen. Their flames burned bright and fast for each other, maybe a little too fast. They would constantly get into fights mainly brought on by drug rage, and it was during one of the drug rages that the unfortunate happened. On October 12, 1978, Sid Vicious woke up to find Nancy Spungen dead on the floor of the Hotel Chelsea in New York City, right on 23rd Street, West 23rd to be precise. She bled to death from a stab wound in the stomach. Sid was arrested that same day and charged with murder. According to police, during the police interrogation, Sid changed his story a few times before finally confessing to the murder. That's according to police. Bail was set at $50,000, the conditions being that he not leave New York City and that he also check in with the police every day and seek treatment for drug addiction at a methadone clinic. During this time, Sid tried to commit suicide twice, once by cutting his wrist with a broken light bulb, which got him a nice little visit to the Bellevue Hospital psych ward. And while there, he tried to commit suicide again by jumping from a window. All the while, his lawyer tried to keep him out of jail. That all changed when Sid went to a club and got into a fight with singer Patti Smith's brother, Todd Smith, after Sid hit on Todd's girlfriend. Sid was arrested for assault. Bail was set again for $10,000, but the bond was covered by his old record label, Virgin Records. The rumor was that Mick Jagger quietly paid for Sid's lawyer during this time. However, it was actually Virgin Records who was covering all of Sid's legal fees. Sid was released from jail again on $10,000 bond on January 18, 1979, even though his trial had officially supposed to start on January 2nd. Sid stayed in jail for a couple more weeks to complete his drug detox program, and on February 1st, 1979, Sid was released from prison. Sid celebrated his release, and being clean from heroin the only way he knew how, he had his friend Peter Gravel get him heroin, then went to his friend Michelle Robeson's apartment on 63 Bank Street in Manhattan, where they were having a little get-together. Sid's mother, Anne, was there as well. And that evening at the party, while talking about the future and making plans in the event of his acquittal, Sid Vicious took the heroin. He overdosed that night and passed away in his sleep, just three months shy of his 22nd birthday. He was found dead the next morning by his mother, and Robeson. His ashes, by the way, are scattered all over Nancy Spungen's grave. Sid's drug-addicted mother, Anne, also ended up passing away from a drug overdose in 1996. As with everything in life these days, there's, of course, conspiracy theories, both covering Nancy's death and also Sid's overdose, including one concerning robbers who supposedly broke into the couple's hotel room trying to steal money that Nancy had, and it turned into a robbery gone wrong along with one about Sid's mother purposely injecting him with heroin in order to kill him. One could, I suppose, say that maybe Sid wanted to die because the thought of spending a good chunk of his life in jail didn't seem like a good thing, and since he had already tried to commit suicide before, that was his way out. Who knows? Truth is, 
we're never going to know. Surprisingly, Oliver Stone hasn't made a conspiracy movie about Sid and Nancy yet, although there is a 2009 documentary made called Who Killed Nancy, which made it seem like a drug dealer killed her. The 1986 movie Sid and Nancy starred a very young Gary Oldman and Chloe Webb. That's a really good one to go check out if you ever get the opportunity. Look it up online. Great movie. Since the punk rock era, the Sex Pistols have become, along with The Clash, the symbols of punk rock, and Sid has become its unfortunate patron saint. What's ironic is that Sid's image is on virtually every t-shirt, poster, and any other thing that can be bought or sold. That's something I'm sure Sid would probably stick his middle finger up at. The death of Nancy Spungen and the arrest of Sid Vicious of the Sex Pistols for her murder, October 12th, 1978. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. October 15th is important in music history for a few different reasons. Two events represent the final time that these things happen for different reasons, while another event inspired a big hit. First off, the legendary club CBGB's in the East Village of Manhattan, New York City, was the epicenter of the punk rock movement in America back in the 1970s. Groups that played at the legendary club include Blondie, the Ramones, the Talking Heads, and Patti Smith. In the early 2000s, the club got into trouble with the landlord. The landlord claimed that the club owed back rent of $19,000. The deeper reason was that I'm sure the landlord wanted to jack up the rent, since it's in what is now a very desirable part of the island of Manhattan. Otherwise, why didn't someone famous just pay the landlord the $19,000 and be done with it? Anyway, CBGB's got evicted and nothing was going to stop it. Not even a movement to get it turned into a national landmark did anything. On October 15, 2006, Patti Smith took the stage at CBGB's, and it would turn out to be the final performance at the club. For those wondering, the name CBGB's lives on, but it's now in Las Vegas at a new location. The original location is now, as of right now anyway, an overpriced clothing store. To their credit, I guess, the location still has original items from the club on its walls, right next to the overpriced shirts and leather jackets. Yay, progress! The final rock performance at CBGB's, given by Patti Smith, October 15, 2006. This next final event is very sad. Someone once asked me if I could build a Mount Rushmore of music acts, who would be on it? I said that you can't do one for music overall because there are too many people who have shaped it throughout the decades. You would actually have to build one for every time period and type of music. For example, for classical music, I would have to put Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart automatically up there with the fourth spot being up for debate. Maybe Brahms? Strauss? Don't know really. For the early part of rock and roll, i.e. from the mid-1950s until, let's say, 1960 when the Beatles strolled in, I would have to put Elvis Presley, Fats Domino, and Little Richard. However, I would also have to have this man front and center, both in terms of crafting rock and roll and also giving it its attitude. The legendary Chuck Berry was born on October 18, 1926 in St. Louis, Missouri. From the beginning, Chuck was interested in music. 
He performed during high school, but once he got out of high school, he settled into normal life, got married, and worked in an assembly plant assembling cars. He still had the music bug, though, so he started performing with the Johnny Johnson Trio. And it was there that he honed his showmanship skills, having studied what T-Bone Walker was doing on stage. One day in May of 1955, Barry went to Chicago, Illinois. He happened to meet the great Muddy Waters, who told him to have a talk with Leonard Chess of Chess Records. Chess took a look at Barry. They saw at the time that rhythm and blues was beginning to go down in popularity, and they were looking to stretch their sound into new genres. They thought that Barry might actually be the person to help them do that. He had a bunch of hits in the first decade of his career, everything from Johnny B. Good to No Particular Place to Go to Rock and Roll Music. Barry geared his music towards teenagers. He talked about good times, cars, girls, and fun. His stage act became legendary, especially when he bent down and hopped across the stage in one leg, which then became known as the Duck Walk. He made a good living with his touring. In short, he became the template for other artists to copy. In 1988, the Grammy Hall of Fame inducted Chuck's first big hit. Not only was it his first big hit, but it was also one of the first rock and roll songs. Maybelline was a song that was a reworking of the song Ida Red by Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys. The song is the template for rock and roll songs. It has cars, women, and a great guitar solo. Barry used to sing it during his club gigs before he recorded it. Chess Records wanted to change a few things on it, including changing the name of the song from Ida Red. Chess didn't want to get sued for using the title even back then. Legend has it that someone looked on the floor of the studio and saw a box from Maybelline Cosmetics, thought that it would fit the song perfectly, but added the extra L to Maybelline to get around those pesky copyright laws. Plus, they added bass to the song in order to make it sound less like a, quote, hillbilly song. They also changed the melody because back then it was common practice to take songs and alter them a little without people getting too crazy about it. These days, if you did that, you'd get a multi-million dollar lawsuit and a social media storm to go with it, or as they like to say these days, interpolate it, which is some crazy made-up word for basically stealing someone's song and changing it a little bit in any event. Maybelline was released in July of 1955 and became a big hit. It was number one on the R&B charts, crossed over to the Billboard Pop Charts, where it went top five. The rock and roll revolution was pretty much in full swing after that. As with most acts and artists, with the good comes the bad, and Barry was no different. Barry was busted as a child for armed robbery. In 1962, he served one and a half years of a three-year prison sentence for transporting a minor across state lines. Some people, however, believe that it was a trumped-up charge based on racism. Trumped, of course, no pun intended. He also, later in life, got caught for tax evasion and also was sued for filming women changing their clothes in a bathroom. The latter charge he denied, but the suit was settled. Chuck continued to play almost 100 shows a year worldwide, then cutting back to playing at least once a month at a local restaurant near St. Louis. I actually saw him perform at a college spring concert back in the 1980s at my alma mater, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Towards the end of his life, as one would expect from a man who lived all the way through his 80s, it wasn't easy to perform. He lived in Ladeau, Missouri, which is just west of St. Louis. For 18 years, he played a monthly gig at a local restaurant and bar in St. Louis called Blueberry Hill. On October 15, 2014, Chuck Berry played his final gig there. Chuck Berry, the icon, passed away in 2017 at the age of 90. The legendary icon, the father of rock and roll, Mr. Chuck Berry, playing his final gig on October 15, 2014. This next event wasn't the end of anything, but rather was the beginning of something else. 
Rick Nelson was a teen idol from the age of eight. He was a performer on his parents' TV hit show, The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. In the late 1950s, he had teen heartthrob hits like Poor Little Fool when he was known as Ricky Nelson. Like many teen idols, he found trying to have an adult career very tricky to navigate. On October 15, 1971, Ricky, who by that time had changed his name to Rick, played a Richard Nader Oldies concert at Madison Square Garden. In a bid to distance himself from his teen idol image, he started out by playing newer songs and not his hits. When he did a cover of Honky Tonk Woman by the Rolling Stones, the audience booed him. Rick walked off the stage at that point and had to be convinced to go back on stage and do his oldies hits. After that, like Taylor Swift breaking up in a relationship, Rick did what every artist does. He wrote a song about the experience. That song, Garden Party, would turn out to be one of Rick's biggest hits and would lead to a comeback. Rick passed away tragically in a plane crash on New Year's Eve in 1985. He left behind some great music and he was an inductee into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in one of its first classes. One of his biggest hits, Garden Party, was inspired by the real-life Madison Square Garden Party, which was held on October 15th, 1971. There are a lot of famous birthdays this week, including Chris DeBerg, Usher, Cliff Richard, Thomas Dolby, Paul Simon, Sammy Hagar, Luciano Pavarotti, Daryl Hall, MC Light, Thelonious Monk, David Lee Roth, Giuseppe Verdi, P.J. Harvey, and John Entwistle of The Who. And all of them are important for various reasons. And happy birthday, including a lot of heavenly birthdays in there, to all of them. But let's get real. There is only one birthday that deserves its own segment this week. And it is the one birthday that everybody talks about every single year it comes up. It's John Lennon's. John Lennon was born on October 9, 1940 in Liverpool, England. His father was a merchant seaman and was away a lot. He eventually came home, but by then John's mother, Julia, had had an affair and was pregnant with that man's child. For some reason, John's aunt called British Child Services and John ended up forced to live with his aunt. John's father came for John a couple of years later and was going to go to New Zealand with John. However, John's mother found out and confronted her husband. Legend has it that John's father forced John to choose between living with his father and living with his mother. After twice choosing his father, he cried when he saw his mother walking away and ran after her. This legend, however, is often in dispute. What is known is that everyone involved decided that John should be reunited with his mother. The reunion wouldn't last too long, though, as his mother was struck and killed by a car in 1958. In 1956, however, John got his first guitar. By the end of that year, John had formed his own group, the Quarrymen, named after Quarry Bank High School. On July 6, 1957, there was a small annual church picnic in Liverpool, England. John's band played at the festival. The only reason why his group was playing there was because of a family connection to the people who decided to add a band to their picnic. Sometimes networking helps. At this picnic was Paul McCartney, who went there to check out the scene. Paul watched the Quarrymen play, and while he liked the band, he really liked John. John wasn't the best guitarist, but he knew how to hold an audience with charm. Paul was immediately struck by John's talent, and after the show, a mutual friend introduced Paul to John. Anyway, while Paul was hanging out with the band, no one was paying attention to him. That is, until Paul brought out his guitar that he carried around with him most of the time and began playing. And now, it was John who was the guy struck by someone else's talent, Paul's. Even though Paul was two years younger, Paul was a much better guitar player. 
Paul even taught John how to write down music onto sheet music paper and how to properly tune a guitar. John asked Paul to join the Quarrymen two weeks later, and the rest, of course, is history. The band would break up, but John and Paul decided to form a new band. The new band went on through a few member changes, including getting Paul's friend George Harrison to play guitar, changing drummers, playing gigs in a different country, and playing their hometown, where a manager found them while on his lunch break from running a record store. The manager, Brian Epstein, had them work with a really good producer. That producer, Sir George Martin, would help Brian craft the group with John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and their new drummer, Ringo Starr, into, of course, the Beatles. I'm not even going to bore you with this time with the Beatles. Those details have been told to death in various books, TV shows, and even movies. He still stands today as a symbol of the counterculture movement of the 1960s, the peace movement of the 1970s, and the cool kid compared to Paul McCartney, whose only crime on the pop culture coolness factor seems to be that he's lived a much longer life compared to John, at least in some people's eyes. I will tell you about one point in his life, though. In 1980, John had come out of a self-imposed exile after taking a few years off to help raise his new son, Sean. He was partially inspired to write new music by a couple of things. The first was by a trip on a yacht that he took from Newport, Rhode Island to Bermuda, where the yacht got caught into a major storm which sickened everybody except for him. As the crew was incapacitated, John had to steer the boat for a few hours, and as he steered, he thought about life and how fragile it was, especially in the middle of a storm in the middle of the ocean. He'd find out the hard way about that later in the year. Suddenly, he had clarity about his music, and he wanted to get back to songwriting, which he did once the yacht pulled into port in Bermuda. The second thing that inspired him was hearing the B-52's debut single, Rock Lobster. He thought it reminded him of the music that his wife Yoko Ono used to do on one of her albums back in the day. Perhaps the world was ready for music like that again if the B-52s were getting popular with that song. John and Yoko decided to both contribute music to his new album, which was supposed to be at least a two-album project. The first album was called Double Fantasy, and the second one was going to be called Milk and Honey. Lots of demo songs were recorded. Then, John gave the demos to his producer, Jack Douglas, with one catch. Jack had to get musicians who John had never worked with. Jack was told to not tell the studio musicians who they were recording for at all. Jack even got a couple of the guys from the band Cheap Trick to help out with some of the recording, since Jack was producing the new Cheap Trick album at the same time. John at the time didn't have a record deal, and no one knew that he was recording new music. John paid for the recording sessions himself. Then, his manager shrewdly leaked the story to the media that John was back in the recording studio, even though the album was pretty much finished at that point. All of the recording companies came running, smelling lots and lots of money. On September 20th, 1980, John inked a new record label deal with a new record label called Geffen Records, beating out a lot of more experienced and better financed record labels. Label head David Geffen's trick to getting John to sign on the dotted line was one of the oldest rules in selling, always talk to the wife first. David knew that Yoko's music was part of his new album, even though he never listened to the demo tapes. By talking to Yoko first, he showed respect to her and her music and saw her as an equal on this album, rather than everybody else who saw John as the driving force. Just a little lesson for you kids out there. The album Double Fantasy came out on November 17, 1980. The first single from the album was the song Just Like Starting Over, which some people thought was John talking about being back recording or about being with a new record label. It was neither of those things. It was just a general feeling that he had since he wrote the song in Bermuda once he got on land after that harrowing trip on the yacht. 
he added the words just like to the title because Dolly Parton had a song starting over at that point in time. Just Like Starting Over was one of the last songs that he finished in the studio and was supposed to be sung in the style of Roy Orbison and Elvis Presley, though John backed off of that part when recording. The song was recorded at the Hit Factory in New York City on August 8th and released in America on October 27th. At first, both the album and the single did so-so. It wasn't the critics' favorite album when it came out, The album did debut high, though, but then it started to drop kind of quickly. In England, the single hit the top 10 quickly, but then dropped as well. In America, on December 8th, the single was at number 6 and was still climbing. And then, fate, or rather the ugly side of man and fame, intervened. December 8th started out a normal day in the life of John and Yoko. They had a photo shoot with famed photographer Annie Leibowitz, and then they went to the record plant recording studio in New York City to work on songs for Milk and Honey. As they were getting into their limo, John signed autographs for some fans who were waiting outside his apartment at the Dakota Building on Central Park West. For one of those fans, he signed a copy of the Double Fantasy vinyl. At 10.50 p.m., he and Yoko came back to the apartment from the recording session. Outside the Dakota, waited the fan who John had hours earlier signed a copy of his album for. And as John walked up to the Dakota, the man, Mark David Chapman, pulled out a gun and shot John, then sat down and started reading a copy of the book The Catcher in the Rye while he waited for the police to show up. John passed away a short time later. Both the album Double Fantasy and the single Just Like Starting Over went to number one very quickly after John's death and stayed there for a number of weeks. Starting Over hit number one in eight different countries, including America, and was the fourth biggest single of 1981. Double Fantasy would go on to win Album of the Year. Considering how much they disliked it when it came out, They sure loved it once he unexpectedly passed away, which is kind of a sad metaphor for life, actually. All I know is that his musical body of work was and is extremely impressive, both from his work with the Beatles and especially his solo albums. It is my belief that even though both he and Paul had great solo careers with many hits, they were actually better when they worked together. What I really know is that the world lost one of the truly great geniuses when he was gunned down outside the Dakota Hotel. The legendary ex-Beatle and great solo artist and a man of peace, John Lennon, born October 9th, 1940. As an added bonus, here are some other John Lennon and Beatles-related things that happened on October 9th throughout music history. For instance, on October 9th, 1965, the song Yesterday by the Beatles hit number one on the Billboard Singles Chart. On October 9th, 1968, the Beatles recorded the song Why Don't We Do It in the Road. On October 9th, 1975, John Lennon's son, singer-songwriter Sean Lennon was born. On October 9, 1984, Ringo Starr started his run as a narrator on the kid show Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. On October 9, 1985, as part of Central Park in New York City, it was rededicated as Strawberry Fields. It is located across from the Dakota Building on 72nd Street and Central Park West, where John was tragically gunned down. On October 9, 2000, the John Lennon Museum opened in Japan. On that same day, Rolling Stone magazine published an interview book with every interview that they had ever done with him. It's called Lennon Remembers the Complete Rolling Stone Interviews, if you ever find it online somewhere. On October 9, 2007, the Imagine Peace Tower, partially designed by Yoko Ono herself, was dedicated in Reykjavik, Iceland. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for October 9th through the 15th. 
Thank you very much for listening and also for watching. If you're watching this on video on Spotify or on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and do all those algorithmic things that they always tell you. Have a good day.